for the reporting. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Deanna Hall. I'm Megan Kaplinski. And we're just going to talk a little bit about what we're doing and what the landscape is today. So we're going to start with just a little bit of who our students really are. And then Megan's going to do a little bit of a literature review. We're going to share five tips. And we're going to really delve into the fourth tip. And that's where we're going to get a lot of meat for the discussion. Um, but any time that you have a question or a thought or something that you want to share with us, please, I mean, this is, we're all in this together. So to start out, you know, thinking about who our students actually are. We know that about 65% of the CSU graduates actually enter the CSU system as transfer students uh, and generally from community colleges. Okay? 55% of those uh, CSU students, credentialed students, do come from community colleges. So as a community college person, we are feeding in lots and lots of folks into the CSU system. Um, and we also know that from a financial perspective, that for our students in this uh, state, that using the community college system is very, very helpful for them as they then transfer into CSU and bachelor degrees and beyond. Looking at, I know we've heard a lot about, um, do, do the people I see in front of me look like me? Okay. If you look at, this comes from the chancellor's office. If we look at what these percentages are, um, Hispanic, white, and Asian um, identified people are, those are who our students are at the community college. That's who we're serving. And so in teacher prep, we should be doing everything we can to get those stu our students into the classrooms for our communities. Just like the last presentation was really talking about public service and seeing myself and the public servants around me. We have, the, we have the people there. We just have to help them get to that next, that next piece. The other thing that we don't talk a lot about is the age of community college students. For me, being someone who was a little older and not that traditional student when I finished my first degree and my second degree and I was a mom and I had two little kids, this is really important for me because at community colleges especially, we don't serve that traditional 18 year old by and large. Okay, and we have to, as we, we talk about our preparations, as we talk about how we're going to serve our students, we have to take into account these are people who are 25, 30, 35, 40 and above. And they have different kinds of responsibilities in their lives and they have a different view, a different framework of um, what they're able to do, how they're thinking about doing it and what they expect out of their education. So that needs to inform our practice. All right. So when we think about what our students look like, we need to also think about what our students look like that our future teachers are going to serve. So here's a little information about that, which has been echoed throughout the day today. And if we're thinking about the shortage, we have the STEM shortage, science and tech and engineering and math shortage, CTE teaching areas and bilingual education. We know that that's the kind of teacher we're gearing for. So a lot of people that are starting up new programs at the community college level, oftentimes the focus of the grant funding or the program is going to be a STEM CTE focus. So a lot of our newer programs have a STEM or CTE focus, and that's how the kind of metrics that we're gathering. For example, at Long Beach City College, we are trying to reach students that are underrepresented in the local classrooms uh, to, as a teacher, and we're also trying to get uh, to the CTE pipeline. Uh, so if we think about our classrooms, our public schools, we can see that we have a heavily white teaching force in a community that is non-white. We also have a lot of students that are Latinx and we don't have that represented in our teaching uh, staff. So what we're trying to do is really do that idea of making sure every student gets the opportunity to have future teachers that look like them. So what does this look like for recruiting? Who are you reaching out to on your campus? We'll dive in in our, uh, one of our later tips about exactly what our programs have started to address this issue. Um, but if we think about men and we 
think about um, the power of having a male in a classroom, we can look at a little data just to kind of frame that too. So men of color non-existent, it seems, in the workforce with less than 10%. And having the attainment gaps really change for especially, let's look into black students, we can see the huge outcome change just by even sometimes having one black teacher for a student of color that is especially disadvantaged. That's the language used, right? So uh, we have more information if you wanted to look at it after the sh uh, slideshow, we go into stuff all about these kind of uh, data and points. This is really small font, you're not supposed to read it right now. Uh, but I wanted to tell you Christian's story and I'll try to stay by our mic because he said to stay in this corner, but uh, Christina and I like to move around too. Um, and especially when I think about Christian, okay, I want to look at his picture right now. He makes me smile. Um, I want to tell you his, a little about his story and uh, how our Long Beach City College teacher preparation program has had some successes that we can really feel in each individual story. So Christian is right here, big grin, right? Not so much there. You have to catch him at just the right moment to get the smile. Uh, Christian's the student who I've had in my class. My colleague had him in his class. I had him twice. This is a student who dropped my class because he had a B halfway through because he wanted to come back and get an A. He had just gone and gotten a job at the local uh, supermarket, was really balancing a heavy schedule and said, Professor, I want to come back when I can get an A. I was like, no, 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 please stay in the class. You're so close, right? Mm -hmm. um, but let me tell you where he started. Christian was one of those students not sure what to do. He knew he was good at, you know, talking when you warmed up to him. He was really good with um, making friends, right? He would come to class late a lot. Once he brought me an apology French toast. You know when a student comes in late with a coffee, you're like, hey, you had time to get coffee and you didn't bring me one? Well, he tried to, to butter me up with a French toast. I, I said, it doesn't work that way, Christian. Uh, but it was really sweet. That was the first semester try. He didn't bring food. Uh, round two. <laughs> uh, but Christian was really warm hearted and I knew there was something in there. So he dropped, but he stayed with the club. So here you can see him at one of our uh, club meetings here uh, promoting the club. He said that the reason he was drawn to our club was because he saw us out on campus a lot wearing our shirt. Now you notice he's not wearing the shirt, even though he had it in the two pictures yet right? But he liked that shirt. He said, you look like you have it together because you, you guys have shirts. So I think you're legit. So I want to join the club. I swear the shirt does magic or something. I don't, I don't know. So long story short, Christian sees a group of people that seem to have it together that are a good cohesive group of friends, small but mighty, and he seemed kind of drawn in. He started out as that shy member, slowly became a club officer. And I'm really excited to say that the second time he took my class, he did very well. He took our other education class, did very well. After not knowing what he wanted to do for a major, he chose teaching, went from elementary to now being firm believer in wanting to be a high school history teacher. So we got him on the path, we kept him on the path. He is having that teacher identity now. And guess what? The day he wore his shirt, he got an award. So Christian, finally in the shirt, right? I'm the proud mom sitting across. I, I texted him like 15 pictures, all blurry. I said, I feel like your mom. I want to make sure this is documented. This is him. Can you see that we're all surprised? Um, he got an award for being the best club senator. So students at our events I'll share about later would say, yeah, you know, I didn't know you had this event, but Christian's been talking about it every Senate meeting for four weeks. So we had to come check it out. Um, and now he's actually been elected to our campus-wide student body. So look at this, the student that kind of dropped a class, yeah, it was to get an A, but still didn't finish, is now like the shining leader with this great smile and wearing the shirt, right? So it's really a great story. This is the kind of student uh, story that we hope to capture with the efforts that we've done, because our focus has always been what do the students want and need and what do they respond to, whether it's buying that club shirt because that seemed to get attention and create an identity mm -hmm. to even more. Well, one of the, some of the things that we're going to talk about have been funded by some grants, but also they're low cost or no cost ways to, to do things to do the kinds of, of work that we want to do to the best of our abilities. So the first one, I mean, is what we're all probably already doing is just leveraging all of the different intersecting initiatives that are happening right now, guided pathways and promise grants, 
um, things with CSUs, the more that we can get everything to align, the easier our job is. So maybe that 14 hour day turns into a 13 hour day, <laughs> you know? So if we're not having to constantly recreate that will and we're letting um, things work together. So if there is a funding stream from Strong Workforce or there is a funding stream from TPP or Ed Futures or whatever other piece, we might be able to, to get a piece of that, especially in our colleges that are not necessarily as supportive of our programs as we would like for them to be or they need to be. The second tip is to not reinvent the wheel. There are, how many of you have been to the TPP website? Yeah, okay, so if you've been on there and you've played around a little bit, um, it's full of really good resources and one of the things that um, you can click on and we're not gonna really do it here, but you can click on explore the model and it'll come up with a wheel like this and you can just click on each of the resources and it gives you articles, it gives you ideas. And so if you're kind of struggling in your area to, to figure out what to do next or how to even start or how to expand, this might be a good place for you to actually be able to, to get some ideas or to put your own ideas, other things that you're doing, um, a place that could house that for some of the rest of us that need some other kinds of encouragement. And if you click on it, like this is one of the, this is what it looks like when you go on to, it's just the teacher preparation um, website. <clears throat> the third tip is what we're kind of doing right here right now, is learning from our colleagues. Because, and I think that this is especially true that if you are only adjuncts in, your, in the department, if you ha even have a department, if you're the only um, full-time faculty member, if you feel isolated and alone, it gets very difficult to do the kinds of really good and important work that we are called to do, okay? Uh, I am very lucky in my department. Um, we have two full-time faculty members, and but it wasn't like that just like five years ago, five or six years ago. It wasn't like that at all. And my, my partner in crime, she is like the other half of my brain. Um, we have gotten to the point where we don't call each other at night, but we come dressed the same at school the next day. We are so in tune with each other. We work very, very well together. And I'm realizing more and more that that is a unique situation for many, um, many in our areas. So I get to have that every day. I get to have someone to bounce ideas off of, to get energized by. But if you're not in that situation, it's really, really important to make those connections. So networking, you know, being on a Zoom call, um, coming to conferences like this, um, so that you can share ideas and tips. So Megan's gonna start um, the next section talking about a little bit about what she does at Long Beach. And then I'm gonna do kind of the second part of that section talking about some of the things, um, practices that we've done at Ventura that are both grant funded and very low, low fee. And I'd like to add um, to tip three that learn from your colleagues is really how I got started at Long Beach City College with my faculty and my department that we all work together on. Um, Renee, who's been kind of the MC of this conference, um, I heard her speak uh, at a conference run for students that I tagged along to, and uh, she talked about mentoring. And so I talked to her afterwards, and she said, let me mentor you. And then all of a sudden, we're on a Zoom phone call. I get a bag in the mail of pins for my club that I was starting, and all of a sudden, I had sample syllabi um, activities and stuff for our intro to elementary teaching class that I had never taught before. So then I um, started started feeling inspired, like, wow, look at all this that she helped me with just by a quick phone call. She was this resource with so much information. Um, so I realized, do you know what? In TPP, everyone wants to help, especially um, I noticed people that have taught K-12 when I used to teach elementary school, everyone would share everything. Now, when I taught high school, it wasn't the same. But okay, going back to teaching elementary school, that's how I feel like a lot of people in TPP are, you know, um, giving you their ideas, helping you to reshape it, making a shared uh, drive. So for me, that's really helpful. And now as part of the LA Teach Regional Collaborative, I got to see Rio Hondo's mentoring program that was just described earlier, that's awesome. And we are finally able to pilot it this fall. And so we get wonderful ideas
is in the website that we shared. This has real Hondo's mentoring program information on it, if I'm not mistaken, um, which could be used as a model for anyone that wants to look into how it worked, for, uh, even going down to the paperwork. What kind of forms do you need for that? Who do you talk to to get permission for the student to be in the classroom? Because we can't always have guests in our classroom. All those kinds of ideas and how to pay. Um, so one part of this tip, which we'll go into for a long time, because this is where we get to tell our stories. Uh, one thing is building partnerships with uh, our other institutions, basically. Um, colleges of ed at four years with community colleges, departments of education, and the K-12s. So what we want to think about is making that seamless pathway. But how many of you work with maybe a K-12 or you just know that your local K-12 do they have a teaching pathway or a child development pathway? Does anyone raise your hand if your K-12 has that as a focus? Mine doesn't either. So what we had to do is we had to think outside the box and kind of do design thinking. Uh, how do we know what kind of program to make when we don't have one right now, which meets the needs of the students? I know, let's start with making clubs at all the high schools. Let's actually get a group of students at the high schools who are interested in teaching and social justice and we'll pick their brain. What do you want? What do you need? Because we're really going to design for the student in mind. We need that clientele, so to speak, so we can cater our offerings towards what they actually needed. So we started with the students. Um, when we think about the kinds of pathways, one that I'm still going to work on this fall, it's an objective, is to go down to Mesa at the high schools um, and other pertinent organizations and departments on your campus. Work with your K-12 um, and maybe make an advisory board. That's something that Long Beach City College did last year. So what we did is we had changed our education course top codes, intro to elementary teaching and intro uh, to teaching, which is a unique to Cal State Long Beach course. It's one unit with 10 hours field work, not the 45 one. And we basically got the idea of putting everything together um, to meet that kind of goal of getting the students that early field work. And long story short, when we changed the top codes to be CTE top codes, we were now eligible to have an advisory committee, which allowed us to bring in workforce partners, to bring in our Cal State, to bring in other community colleges, our counseling, our science, and basically go cross-disciplinary at our campus to make ourselves visible. Because a lot of times we're not seen, so the needs of the program go unmet by programming other plans because, you know, no one knows about it. So you want to make it visible and com compete with the other programs, even if you're not CTE in some of your classes, because the AAT in elementary teaching, for example, that's a transfer degree. So you're kind of this hybrid, right? So you want to get yourself visible, and an advisory committee could be great. Uh, if we think about Long Beach as an example today, we can talk about the Long Beach College Promise. A few years ago, there was a Governor's Innovation Award grant, and it really allowed us to make the education pathway more visible. It was one of a few pathways chosen to really try to make it clear from our local K-12 to our Cal State after our community college. And so what we did is we had barely any students. They have so many students from other colleges. If you read in that letter that's in your bag, the Cal State State um, partnership, it does reference Cal State Long Beach working with Cerritos College, not with Long Beach City College because we weren't big on that yet. Um, but you can see that um, our offerings were really small. Is this the slide with it? Uh, they had 930 students, half their students transferred in, 14 was two years ago in the fall. That's it. So we're starting small, but we are growing. Um, what did we do? to try to grow this. Well, like I said, we started clubs and we're starting to align our classes and we're looking into dual enrollment. But one of our roadblocks is no one from our high schools wants to come to class on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to go to our LAC campus because they live by our PCC campus. And the only education pathway, which is like half child development and something random like cooking, I don't, I don't know, it's like very loosely education related, um, it's kind of over. So we're wondering, what do we do, right? So we're trying to do things like create a day at either Cal State Long Beach or Long Beach City College where future teachers come together and form that identity early. Because I taught high school briefly, I know most of those students did not want to imagine themselves 
as a teacher. They're thinking how to get out of the classroom and not how to get in. Uh, but anyhow, our idea is that we're going to have an annual event. Now this is a huge challenge still because even though we've done this event a few times, um, we have to start over because the teacher retired at the one high school who had any semblance of an education pathway. Now we have to start all over with recruiting. When that grant ended that brought us together regularly, we no longer got email replies from certain you know, folks because they have, like most of us do, 14 hour days. So if you're not required by the grant to meet, you're not necessarily gonna meet because you have another grant that's requiring you to do those other obligations. Um, but our clubs did start educators rising uh, clubs at the high schools. So that's a really interesting route that some colleges are using too to form their clubs. So if you're wondering, how do I make a club to kind of design things in mind with a student? You may want to look into Educators Rising. I think you pay for curriculum, but there's also free resources available. They do wonderful conferences. They do a lot of information um, that they can share if you're paid. I think it's curriculum. Sometimes people are talking about using that to make it a course. So I personally want to know more about that, but we're not there yet uh, for various reasons. Um, what we have at our college is newly rebranded reading and teacher preparation department. It took a few years for AAT degree to have all the courses with their CID numbers in line. And then we were able to start offering it last fall. So what we did since then is we changed the top codes on our ed classes because we wanted to be more obviously eligible for strong workforce funding and CTE top codes is the way to do that and the state is encouraging us to change those codes to CTE codes. Um, we did create the advisory board I shared about which gets us workforce partner relationships that are started. We can do things like career fairs more easily and have automatic list of VIPs if we need a guest speaker or if we want to host an open house like we've done. Um, Right now, we are waiting for our stackable certificates to go through the curriculum process. And we're one of the uh, first, I believe, to submit to the chancellor's office, if it goes through local curriculum first, um, a STEAM certificate. Looks a lot like the AAT in elementary teaching plus a tech class, so it can be STEAM. And that way, uh, our workforce partners agreed at our advisory board meeting that they would uh, see that as favorable on a resume and you know value a student who had that basic understanding to work at the YMCA after school program or as a college aide. Um, we're still researching dual enrollment like I said and something we're starting this semester after uh, kind of reimagining our classes to see which are the best for students is a 12-week class. So our classes are going to be late start this semester in order to make sure it's seamless to get them placed in local school districts. Now that we've grown, we need to work with more districts than just Long Beach Unified. So we've developed agreements with other school districts this summer so our students have a, a menu of options of where they can go and do that really valuable early field work. Um, some of the events that have been really fun I, I don't know, I'm really into the events as a club advisor. <laughs> um, because you advertise, you market, you get them pertinent information about your program, and you get them to make that connection and identity of a teacher. So some of ours are open houses at each of our two campuses, where we have like a mini job fair counselor, you know, promotional day with food and um, advising, just on the spot, walk up, grab something to eat talk to the counselor, talk to someone about the job at the YMCA down the street. Um, a social justice panel discussion we held last year and for the past couple years with different themes where we invited a preschool teacher, uh, some K-12 teachers and even college professors to talk about teaching um, the earliest children that we get to work with all the way to college uh, to adults. Um, we participate in on-campus events. Our college has every fall now a social science night and every spring a science night. So we latch on. Our students at science night, for example, do something for the community kids that come to the event. Um, my son was scared personally when I showed him the cadaver room a few years ago. He was a little too young. He couldn't wear a skeleton shirt for a year. But um, now he would love it at age 11. Um, but we do something hands-on so there is something for the younger 
guests to our event and hook them on science, right? Um, we have a club teacher appreciation week always in the spring with things like speed teaching where we invite the other clubs to teach. They get a booth too. If you want to learn to braid hair, come to this one. You want to learn about the LGBTQ uh, unicorn, come to this one. You want to learn about this or that, how to say something in French, go to French Club's booth. And that way we got to work interdisciplinary and um, have a more broad approach. We do tours for high school kids. We do commercials in other classrooms where we guests speak. And um, we just try to get out there. So. Uh, I went through that kind of fast, so I'm always available uh, to chat more. I could probably talk a lot about all of those and share flyers with you if you want them, just like Renee did for me. Um, please let me know at the end. So, Megan, how, how long have you been working um, on, on building your program? Oh, our program, we used to have something called City Teach, I don't know, 20 years ago. It wasn't a full program. Um, I came along after teaching at the public district as a part-timer and then for five years have been working either as a volunteer without a um, title or then with a grant <laughs> with a title given to me. Um, for those five years and since I came from our local K-12 and I went to my community college as a student, um, I only wanted to come back and teach in my community college that I loved and only wanted to give back to my community. I had this weird thing with <laughs> if I'm changing jobs it's going to be for Long Beach and it worked out um, because I was so into the idea of coming back to my college who gave me even more than UCLA did when I transferred. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Five years, but in my heart, I always wanted to come back, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. And the reason that I had asked that question is because when um, I came to Ventura Community College um, just a little over four years ago, I had a pretty solid structure underneath me because of the work that my predecessor had done for the previous seven years. So the things like the top codes, um, you know, that was already done. We're housed in CTE. We are a part of the team. You know, we're not having to, you know, please let us use these top codes and be part of the team so that we're eligible for a strong workforce and get to, or some people would say have to, you know, have an advisory board. That's just part of the way that we operate. So when my predecessor came, the program was much as you have described and doing the sorts of things that you're doing now. She set such a strong foundation um, with the college and with the community. Um, since she reti has retired, I've been able, and my colleague Rachel Johnson have been able to build, you know, from that. So this is kind of like the next phase um, of some of the things that that have happened at Ventura previously, as well as that's happening at Long Beach. So from just a little bit about um, our department, we have a very holistic approach to um, to the care of children from birth, you know, to we're all children, you know, to 96. Um, our CTE division houses both child development and education. We are a department. I am co-chair of the department. We are a Hispanic serving institution. About 70%, 60 to 70% of our students are Hispanic. Our particular um, coursework has a STEM emphasis. Yes, we do everything else, but because of um, where we're located and because of the under being underprepared in certain kinds of areas, and we all know that teachers tend to a lot of times shy away, especially if you're working with younger children. I don't know how to do math, I don't know how to do science, and so really helping students feel comfortable with what it means to be able to teach science and math, so we focus on that. We've recently revised our um, transfer degree so that it will um, have the qualifications for either a traditional path or to do the ITAP, you know, the, the integrated pathway. So there's like two classes difference. And so we worked really hard with our, our local um, CSU to make sure that that was available to students as an option. Um, we also really focus on having our students use the standards, whether it's early childhood standards or whether it is elementary ed standards. That is part of their textbook. They are getting that in every class. So because what we say, what we get from our employers at our advisory board meetings is they've got to know this. This is how our funding does. These are the kinds of assessments that we have to use. 
And so when they, they become much more um, employable, when they come to their employers, to, when they come to that interview with a base knowledge of those sorts of things. And also in our department, the age of the college students that we have are even um, higher than the, the typical college age student for Ventura. And here's just some graphics. This is um, our gender and ethnicity. This is our Hispanic population. You can see over the last 20 years how demographics have changed. This is uh, Caucasian. Uh, the green is Asian. The purple is black. The red is um, Native American. And there are some other colors in here that I can't even distinguish because they're so low even being this close up. You can see how the population um, has changed even over the last 20 years. So when our population changes, the needs that and to be able to be responsive to our students also change. And so we're trying to do that. And here is um, the demographics for the college by age as well. You can see how it's changing. So degrees and certificates. Over the last four years, we, we are steadily increasing our degree and certificate completion. So in the 14-15 school year, we had 56 degrees and certificates that were awarded. Last spring, we had 129. So we're really very happy that our students are coming and staying and that they're completing. That's the most important thing. And then this last spring, we had our very first graduating class of elementary ed folks, and it was beautiful. One of the things, this is us being silly, because we, you know, on our graduation day, we buy them stoles, because uh, one of the things that, you know, we know about our students is that um, about 80% of our students or more are on financial assistance and they don't necessarily, you know, they've spent their money on the cap and gown. So we buy them stoles and we throw them a party at the, you know, on graduation day and we sing songs and we have now got a tradition where we go from one side of the campus to the other singing um, something akin to uh, um, a, a children's song, um, Going on a Bear Hunt. You know that song, but we uh, sing, we make up our own words to it, and everybody just kind of goes out of the way. But again, it's about making that presence on campus. When people see you, know you, hear you, they're like, oh, they have a question, they pop, you know, they'll call on you. So it's making yourself known. Um, one of the things that I'm just in, I feel incredibly blessed to be part of right now is um, our T Rex, the Teacher Resource and Education Center for Students. Um, it started out with what we call student connections. We know from research that when students feel like they're part of a cohort, when they feel supported, when they're connected with teachers, when they can get the extra help, when they can ask the questions, they're more likely to do well and to complete, not just their classes, but their certificates or degrees. So we had this brainstorm that we have this class, we have a lab school at Ventura, and we have an adult classroom within that lab school. And we thought, okay, whenever during the day that this, this classroom is not being used, usually around lunchtime, my counterpart and I, we are going to make sure that our office hours are in that room at that time when people want to eat their lunch in a room that they're familiar with where they're probably just coming from class or they're getting ready to have class so that we can just sit and be with them. You know, and we can do student advising and we can answer those questions about that assignment coming up and they can all hang out together and they can talk crap about the teachers if they want to or good things or you know we can explore different materials and so we did this um, the first year that I was here about four years ago and we called it student connections and we did this and we did this and we started keeping track of hours and students and in a very short period of time, um, my dean was very happy with it, one of my VPs is very happy with it, and strong workforce money was coming in, and they were gonna get rid of one of the trailers at the, um, at the school, and my dean piped up and said, no, I, I would li really like the idea of maker spaces, um, because I had been pushing this idea. And she was wonderful. She set aside a little bit of money, promised me this and that. And a few years later, we have a space 
in a trailer that they have redone where our offices now are that is a hub it has all kinds of resources for students in child development and education and we're even inviting our liberal arts friends who are a little bit separate from us but we're still inviting them but it has you know those those children's books those textbooks those laminators those resource books you know, all the things that we need to have in this field to be hands-on okay and to and, and this is a place for them so they can they've even got computers in there so if I'm taking an online or a hybrid class I can sit there and I can do that if I need some help registering for class there's somebody that's going to be there to help with that yes ma'am no, I just wanted to um, say the idea of the office hours and the resource room is fabulous. We have a resource room. And the one thing that we did at, I'm sorry, at Gavilan College, we asked students, you know, just questions regarding teaching and what they would, you know, really like from professors. And the one thing that came out is office hours. We write office hours. They don't realize that that's their time. So we've shifted it to student. Like we've had to really think about our language and so I'm sorry, that was just really exciting and aha, uh -huh, and I'm totally gonna do that next time. Yes. <laughs> Good, at low cost option to help, yeah. And that's it, because I mean, how many of us have office hours listed in our syllabi, and if we go to our office, students never come. It's like, good, shut the door, I gotta get some work done. I, some of us they think like that, but it really is about an opportunity for students to connect with us. But some of them don't even know where our offices are because we're hidden across campus somewhere in a corner. I was just wondering how many hours a week it's open. So it's, we had a soft opening in uh, the fall. So it was really only about um, 12 hours a week in the fall. Last semester, we were able to be open from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. Um, four days a week. We had actually wanted it to be open a little bit earlier than that. We wanted to just stay quite a bit later to try to really capture some of those students who um, were coming at, at night, who were working adults, and at least last semester, um, that wasn't that wasn't when it was being used. So being good stewards of our financial resources, we cut back the hours to when that's when the students were actually there. We're gonna try something different, you know, this coming semester, um, but it, it's be trying to be responsive to our, our students, yes and yes. How are you staffing it or who is staffing it? Right, so my coworker and I, she and I are there and we do part. We were able to have student workers um, last semester that we're running into a little bit of a snag <laughs> this semester with that. So, but we have our grant director, we have a grant director at our school and she is helping us brainstorm how we might be able to do that. We actually have one of our adjunct faculty that, you know, I love this, this is a wonderful opportunity. If you're able to, I would love to come in and do this for part of my load. So, and just be there, which to have an adjunct faculty member come in and say, I want to be part of this is wonderful. So I was going to ask that, but I also want to ask, um, so how do you track, maybe you already said this, how do you track the hours that they're in there? Like, how do you know? That's great. We have it, right, we're doing it old school with pen and paper. We have a sign-in book. Sign -in. And we've just, we've used the sign-in book and it's right by the door by our, we have a, I don't know if you can't see this, but we have a stuffed dinosaur that's this big that our dean got us <laughs> that the children in the lab school named PB Bonkers, and it's got a pirate hat on it, and there's a sign-in book. And so whoever's job, it, you know, whoever is on call in the T-Rex, the you know, you have to stop by the T-Rex and sign in, in and out. We are hoping to go to like a electronic version of that but you know those 14 hour days you know <laughs> that that will be somewhere down the road but yeah so we were able last semester to serve 802 extra student hours of service and so we've been working at this for a few years and I think that this is part of the reason that we're seeing the increase in completions um, and certificates and degrees there's a correlation at least um, other things that we found that are really important. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. Um, when you're referring to your lab school, you're talking about early childhood or K through 12. It is an early childhood lab okay. school. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we are child development and elementary ed all together. Right. I was like, well, I want that space, and I'm like, I don't think they're going to give me a K through 12 school. I can't well, imagine. Well, and you know, one of the things is that because we have both 
the elementary ed and the child development, right. it's the the area is stocked with materials that would be appropriate for the entire age span. Um, and we're working really hard, because you know how there's that kind of weird division between early childhood and K-12? We don't like that. That's not okay. It is a spectrum. Everybody needs to you know, get along and play with everybody. So at our school, we're working really hard to erase that, um, that barrier, you know, between the, the ECE world and the elementary ed world. And in do and part of that is the faculty development pieces. So we asked um, faculty what it is that they needed, what it is that they wanted, and they wanted some additional um, uh, professional development and professional developments for their own particular interests, but also us as a group. So just recently, this week, we contracted with the Ventura County Office of Education. They gave us some topics. As a department, we picked out which topics would be most applicable for all of us, and we spent two days in PD. This is something that not all of us necessarily are going to be able to do, but it was able to be funded in part by the Ed Futures piece. But even if it's you know somebody goes to a conference or goes to a workshop or does an online training and is able to bring it back to a staff meeting to do that, we've had um, people do that, our faculty do that for us as well. Um, the other thing is that for because we are um, we do work with Edge Futures as well as TPP. The AQ training, how many of you have heard of the AQ training? So our, and I'm in CTE, so it's that crib to career sort of pathway. So this is um, uh, Grant Gould, um, help pilot this program, and it's an online cohort model, one year long training for CTE faculty that to help them be better teachers, the pedagogy and, and those sorts of things. And so not only was my division looking at this, but then our region picked it up and decided as a region, um, as a regional project in common, to pay for faculty to take this training. So our education faculty, you know, they, a couple of them took it in our department. They're like, yeah, it's really good content, but it's not anything I don't already know. But imagine if, you know, there were other people that you're working with who aren't at people of, ed, you know, in education, they are content major, how they might benefit from this. So just looking at education all over the place. We also um, are moving towards um, OER and zero textbook cost classes. So we're, we're working on the OER stuff. Right now, about 13 out of 19 classes that we offer are zero textbook cost, because again, we're trying to be mindful of the financial um, situation of our students and even just the time and attention to be able to go and get a textbook. You know, maybe I can read my lessons or my chapter, or whatever, on my phone while I'm waiting for my kid to get out of school. You know, so being aware of those things as well. Um, and we're also working with the OER grant to move some of our additional classes as online options as well. The last year we've been working with internships, partnership, 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 building out both classroom teachers, as classroom teachers, and um, still working with children and families, but not in the classroom setting. How many of you have had students that um, like, you know what, I don't think I wanna work with kids. I did this whole degree, I did this, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is, it's like, it would have been nice to know that beforehand, right? <laughs> So this is an opportunity for students to still work in public sector, still work towards um, you know, using what they're passionate about, but not necessarily having to be directly in a, in a classroom setting. So this is an opportunity for them to do this. Um, we also, I'm looking at the time, I'm sorry. I'm talking a lot. Um, one of the other things that we've been able to do is that in our practicums, um, we video record the students while they're doing their implementation of their lesson plans. We've got these really cool swivels. You wear a necklace and it follows you around everywhere you go. And they're required to view it. And we're required to view it. And the kind of feedback that they can get from watching themselves. Um, and it's always the same thing. Oh, I hate seeing myself on video. Oh, I hate hearing my voice. You know, they get over that in about a week or so. Um, but the kind of feedback is really beneficial to them to grow as a professional as well. These are just some examples of the kinds of collaborations and um, involvement that we've done both at our college, in our local community, and then at our region and state level as well. 
Um, and then some other things that have happened. And this is all a result of the collaborations we've done with our partners, whether it's the college level, the, the community level, this, the regional level, is that we've been able to hold a conference for students and community members um, over the last two years, we're getting ready to do our third one, and we do it in collaboration with Pearson Mission Colleges, which are both in LA County. So it's a cross-county collaborative. It's just like, like, you know what? Our students need to figure out what it means to continue to do their professional development you know, throughout life. And we charge a teeny little bit of money, just enough to cover you know, food costs, and we hold it at the colleges, and we do it on a Saturday, and, um, it was inexpensive compared to what it might be otherwise. We worked at the STEM Symposium doing presentations. Our lab school got a grant to help parents actually go to school and have appropriate childcare. Um, we've gotten awards for the work that we do with STEM. Um, so, and this is all a result of the collaborations that we've been building over the last few years. <sighs> Were there any questions? I talked a lot and really fast. Anything else? Our final tip is to join a professional organization if possible, or at least stock the website and download any good information. Um, I get to be on the board of NACTEP. NACTEP um, sometimes flies by a lot of people's radar, but it's the National Association of Community College Teacher Education Programs. So I serve as secretary on the board for the, this is my second year as secretary, and it's a great organization. Right now we're finishing a pilot with the uh, organization AACTE. So right now people were joining both AACTE and NECTEP. That partnership is changing and so I'm not actually sure yet how it's going to look uh, next year. Um, additionally, you might have seen the booth for ACTEP. ACTEP is basically like the four-year version of CCTE, if you've heard of CCTE, who is also here. Um, and their conference is coming up in October. ACTEP is having a conference, is it also in October? Um, so long story short, um, groups like this and NAUIC, these are things that you can network and get more contacts for. Specifically, ACTEP, which is reinvigorating, is going to um, provide that advocacy statewide for California Community College teacher education programs. NACTEP does that on the national level. Um, both are going to be really great resources. Quite a lot of the people here and presenting here and organizing this Ed Futures convening um, are members of ACTEP on the board and or um, started up originally a few years ago, so it's coming back. Um, by being part of these organizations, you're able to get the conference rate that's even better, but that's really not what it's all about to me. It's about making connections with other people that have been through what you're going through. And without these kinds of organizations, I know that I would have missed out on a lot of best practices. But luckily, more regional collaboration is going on with Ed Futures and Strong Workforce, which is making it more um, common for you to, to latch on and join one of those regional groups if you're not already part of a Strong Workforce regional collaborative or weren't part of Education Futures itself. So um, I highly suggest checking these out if you haven't been to the ACTEP booth and then of course the CCT booth is here too. So we're going to do a closing reflection. So if you can go back to your group you started with in just a minute after thinking about your answer, what are three ideas or pieces of info that really stuck with you? Two topics you have a question about or an idea you have that you think you could implement right away when you're back to your program. And we'll come around and we can answer questions too at this time. <laughs> 